Welcome. Thanks for joining our Weave Online user group. Uh, if this is your first time, Welcome. Uh, this is something that we've been doing on Tuesdays uh, is, as a seasonal thing. Last year, uh, we had them every week. Uh, this season in the spring, we're doing them every other week because uh, we're doing other activities as well. Uh, and uh, we are a company called WeWorks. I'll chat a little bit about that. So if this is your first time, welcome. If you've come before, then welcome back. It's great to see some familiar names. My name is Tama Onakahara. I'm head of the developer experience team here at Weaveworks. And fortunately today, we have other members of our team who will be speaking and be involved. Uh, Lee Capilli is our developer experience engineer based out in Colorado. And he'll be going through what we call a GitOps hands-on. It was actually developed by another person on our team, Stefan Prodan, who's out in Romania. And uh, it's something that we've had out there. I'll have this little bit.ly link on the bottom uh, for all of you if you've never seen it before on, on my slides so that uh, you may not be able to follow along in real time, uh, but at least you'll be able to see Lee go through it and uh, hopefully you can do it yourself. We've also got Stacy Potter here, who's our community manager, and she's the one who sets up these fantastic uh, series that we call WOOGS for the short term for Weave Online User Group. So let's get started. A little bit about us. Uh, I said we are a startup called Weave Works. We're based in San Francisco, London, New York, Berlin, and Colorado, as well as with distributed teams. Uh, and if you've heard of the technology RabbitMQ, our CTO, uh, our founding CTO, and our CEO um, created the technology in the company RabbitWorks and sold it to VMware. Uh, and then fast forward, they started seeing needs in the containers and growing Kubernetes space. So started building first open source product projects and then products uh, into this company that became Weave Works. Uh, we're VC funded by a variety of VCs, um, one including Excel Partners, uh, another I'll mention is Google Ventures. Um, that one in particular because of uh, our commitment and involvement in the Kubernetes space, especially our developer experience team uh, does a lot of uh, um, upstream contributions, we're involved in the CNCF and all those various SIG meetings. Lee's definitely one of those, uh, as well as we have our own uh, open source projects, uh, a variety of whom have gone into the CNCF um, or build on to um, Kubernetes or build uh, with or onto other technologies in the Kubernetes space. Uh, so I'll share some of these here. Um, some of you might know us from WeaveNet. That was, I think, our, our, one of our first projects, um, which still is the, one of the premier projects for networking your Kubernetes clusters. Um, we have Flux and Cortex that are now in the CNCF. Uh, at this point, I guess it's been um, well over a year, if not two years, for Cortex and uh, about a year with Flux. Uh, and if you've heard the term GitOps, and that's what brought you here, uh, Flux is really the project that got, it, got us to that place. Um, we were both building it out uh, with a particular design in mind, as well as we noticed uh, movements out in the Kubernetes space that then our CEO said, you know, I think GitOps is, is maybe the word for that and kind of took off. Um, our GitOps uh, hands-on today will be using uh, Flagger, uh, which I, I mentioned uh, was created by Stefan Pradhan, and then he built this hands-on based on that. And that helps you do things like canary deployments, uh, blue-green, uh, A-B testing, uh, leveraging service meshes that are out there. It first started with Istio, and then he's expanded to others. So you'll be able to see us do a canary deployment with the GitOps hands-on using that, as well as other technologies. Um, and we have many, many more here uh, that we don't have time to go through, but uh, you can see the various projects that we've worked on and you can check them out. We also do have a product uh, or several products at this point. Our first one is called Weave Cloud and it's a SaaS product that helps you do Kubernetes management, monitoring and automated deployments. So it leverages a lot of the open source components that we mentioned, including Prometheus, uh, and then build them into a SaaS product. Um, where it has a shared UI and they you know, leverage each other's um, capabilities together for an enhanced experience. Uh, definitely one call out there is if you are interested in using Prometheus, but you don't want to set it up, uh, you don't want to maintain it, and most definitely you don't want to be dealing with storing the metrics, uh, Weave Cloud is definitely a great solution. Uh, our latest product is called Weave Kubernetes Platform, and that is because uh, we built 
leave cloud on Kubernetes on AWS. And as we were selling that SaaS product, a lot of people were really interested in the fact that at this point we've been running Kubernetes in production for four years. So they said, well, we'd love to know more about the platform that you um, built out for product as well as, you know, can you help us out on our own uh, journey, so to speak, in Kubernetes. Uh, so we kind of, uh, expanded to include some consulting training and support for people who wanted it, um, as well as help them get started or get advanced with Kubernetes using this new Weave Kubernetes platform that we built. If you've read about GitOps or you kind of learned about the concepts, it'll really give you a hands-on experience as well as, like I said, a canary deployment, um, being able to uh, get your hands dirty there. And then if you're looking for that uh, for uh, enterprise level, like, uh, you know, not single repo, repo, but multiple, uh, multiple clusters, team management, uh, um, access management. Uh, if you haven't checked, heard of us, uh, we're weave.works, uh, check us out. And uh, I apologize for uh, having a little bit of wonky uh, Wi-Fi here. Um, so let me actually, Double check here. All right, just checking the uh, the docs. So, uh, just quickly here, one thing I was just trying to emphasize was that the GitOps hands-on that we're doing today, that Lee will be covering, is an open source version for you to kind of get your hands dirty. Um, if you've read about GitOps and you've kind of read about the concepts, it will give you a very practical. Um, sort of single user experience of that so that hopefully it'll make it more tangible. Uh, and then our Weave Kubernetes platform is an enterprise level for that. So, you know, teams, multiple clusters, um, you know, uh, access management and all that. So that's what the difference is between these two. So hopefully this hands-on will be helpful to get you on the first step to that. Does that help? <laughs> so, uh, all right, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, so, as I mentioned, we have Lee Capilli, who's one of our developer experience, experience engineers here in the developer experience team. Uh, he'll be walking you through this hands-on. Uh, in most cases, these sessions go about 45 minutes. Uh, they could be even shorter. We're pretty flexible with that. Uh, but if you guys have lots of questions or if it takes time to go through the whole thing, uh, we have a hard stop at the end of the hour. So we will go up to 60 minutes uh, to allow that. But we, these generally hover at about 45, 50 minutes. Uh, we're using a platform called Zoom. Uh, to ask your questions, please use the chat box and make sure that you chat to all panelists and attendees. Uh, if you have trouble finding the uh, chat, the button for the chat box, sometimes hitting escape gets you out of full screen mode and helps you see some of the Zoom dashboard capabilities so you can find that chat button. I will hand it over to Lee. Awesome. Thanks, Tama, for the great introduction. So um, I will set up my screen sharing here and yank that from Tamo. Thank cool. You. So everyone should be able to see my screen now. Yep, I can see. And I'll just like bump that over there or something. Great. Look at that. All right. Um, I wanted to. Hi, I'm Lee. Uh, I'm really excited to, to be here with all of you. Thanks so much for attending. Uh, I wanted to make sure that this session is useful for all of you folks. And so um, I noticed already there was quite an interesting question. Uh, from Mr. Or well, I'm assuming actually Sam Nickerson. Sorry if I misgendered you, but um, yeah, current quest is what can uh, WKS Cuddle do for me if I'm using Proxmox? Uh, Proxmox is pretty dope, and you're trying to proof of concept GitOps uh, at probably wherever you work. Um, feel free to speak up or um, or ask questions, and. Um, yeah, Proxmox is a really simple virtual machine manager that uses KVM and Kimu. Uh, I've played around with it before and know folks have used it in production. And where does that bridge to WKS Cuddle? Right? So Proxmox has been around here for a while. It's, it's really simple cluster manager uh, that gets you VMs and you can do networking and storage and all that things, all of that stuff with it. Great infrastructure provider if you wanna build a platform on top of it. So say you wanna bring like Kubernetes into your Proxmox cluster. Uh, then you could do something like start to play with WKS Cuddle. Uh, WKS Cuddle is, an, I'm showing the Git repo here. Uh, it's an open source version of our WKP platform that Tamo mentioned. 
Uh, and it allows you to easily manage a single Kubernetes cluster along with all of its add-ons and uh, various configurations in a well-factored way. Um, there's some good opinions that start off the bat, hooks you up with GitOps day one uh, with your cluster. And it does use a cluster API provider. So we built an SSH implementation, which will allow you to bridge the gap from the infrastructure that's provided by Proxmox. Uh, and then once you, however you're doing configuration management with those machines, you plug the credentials into WKS Cuddle, and it'll be able to spawn a Kubernetes cluster and manage it uh, using the cluster API definitions from inside of that repository in a GitOps way. So hopefully that's helpful. And then, um, Rahan is saying, if I use GCP, is there an equivalent? Um, then Omar mentions that Proxmox is similar to vSphere. Um, yeah. um, these are a little bit off topic, so maybe we can take these at the end, because I don't want to, most people yeah. come here to see the GitOps hands-on, so I don't want yeah. them to feel confused why we're talking about a completely different topic here. I'm glad that you guys are very enthusiastic and are looking at GitOps for WKS Cuddle, but I'm sure we'll have time at the end, so maybe we can address those later. Yeah. Then just as far as GCP equivalent, you could use the SSH provider, uh, but I'd personally recommend just using GKE. So yeah, check out. No, it w sounds like there's a lot of passion. So maybe we can have a session on WKS Cuddle in the future. Yeah. So the next thing is just um, if you're in Colorado, come reach out to me. Uh, I like to do parkour. This is a picture of my dog and my spouse. And that's just like for my Instagram. Um, but yeah, I live here. Uh, let's meet up and have lunch, or if you do parkour or wanna learn parkour, let's train together. Uh, today, as Tom mentioned, I'm gonna be going through the EKS GitOps Challenge. Uh, so this is a dope um, workshop that we put up at ekshandsonflagger.dev. And um, if you can run into us physically, we'll give you this really sweet t-shirt with the uh, cephalopod mascot here. It's our cuttlefish. Uh, this hands-on lab is gonna go through a couple concepts. Uh, the first thing to know is that the infrastructure is going to be provided by EKS Cuddle. And then on top of that, we're going to be using a service mesh. Um, that service mesh is going to be AWS's app mesh. And then, um, yeah, <laughs> we'll see you there, Christian, at uh, KubeCon EU coming up here. Uh, and then, okay, well, you've got this service mesh and you've got some sweet Kubernetes resources provided to you by Amazon. Uh, but then how can you do interesting things in a simple way on top of the service mesh? And so Stefan uh, Prodan, he's my teammate, Tamil mentioned him earlier, he built Flagger. If you go to flagger.app, you can learn about how Flagger will give you safer releases and flexible traffic shaping and routing uh, on top of Kubernetes in a Kubernetes native way, not just some like bash scripts that are running from your CI pipeline in a really sketchy way. And um, I really like Flagger. I think it's one of the most innovative things that's happening uh, in the Kubernetes space for traffic shaping right now. Um, one of the coolest things about Stefan is that he has incredible bone structure. So here's his website and you can go follow him on Twitter. I respect this guy a lot. And um, yeah. So if we go through the lab, you just click get started and then it tells you a little bit about the prereqs that you need. If you wanna learn a little bit about the fundamentals of the lab, uh, in the intro section, we can talk about what actually is GitOps. So you've heard us mention this term um, the cool thing about this whole hands-on lab is that once you've got your EKS cluster with your service mesh and you've got Flagger installed and all of that, uh, we're actually not going to be doing any kubectl applies. So kubectl being the API command line tool that people would use to normally talk directly to a Kubernetes cluster, we're not going to do anything with writing manifests and modifying things in the cluster through kubectl. We'll use kubectl as an introspection tool for reading about the state of the cluster. Uh, but what's great about GitOps is that everything, the configuration of your cluster can be primarily driven through a Git repositories config. And once you have that, you win a couple of things. For one, all of your teams, the people that you work with, they're probably already managed well and, and separated properly with permissions and authority and merge you know, rights and things like that inside of whatever tool you're managing to, you're using to manage your Git repos. And so GitOps automatically gives you the benefits of that. You probably also store all of your code changes in Git, hopefully. And so this gives you a bridging for what the configuration of your infrastructure is and the configuration of your app. 
And so you get to this point where everything that's declared about the desired state of your business, like be it your software and the infrastructure requirements to keep your business actually running are in a Git repository, which means that if you tear it all down, you can do an exercise in disaster recovery, whether that's intentional or in response to some serious emergency, where you can spin everything back up from the declared state of your Git repository. And so that's when we get into really conversa interesting conversations about like what GitOps can do for your platform uh, in order to run your business. And then also there's this kind of newer industry term called progressive delivery, which encompasses things like blue-green deployments and canaries, as well as other traffic shaping techniques such as A-B testing. Uh, and so if you needed a little bit of an introduction to what that is, then we've got a paragraph about it here, as well as some links to uh, some great blog posts and other resources for the prerequisites needed to uh, be able to operate with canaries. And then you'll go through the prereqs and install all the tools. And then you'll create a cluster. So I've, went, I've gone ahead and done this ahead of time. Uh, you can see right here that I'm just using a bash here doc. In reality, this config file is something that you'd probably check into a Git repository. And you can see here that is EKS Cuddle API in similar style to Kubernetes API. This is a cluster config. Here I'm naming my cluster AppMesh in the region US West 2. And then there's a list of node groups that I can provide. So here you can see I have one node group of desired capacity two with a large node type, a couple of um, other uh, parameters here for volume size, as well as enablement of IAM permissions for use with app mesh and the necessary introspection uh, to do metrics um, introspection with, with app mesh. Uh, are these managed nodes? Um, in a way, so EKS Cuddle will template a bunch of uh, cloud formation for you and then uh, create those stacks inside of AWS. Sorry, reading a bunch of questions. Uh, Sam says he's used Terraform but hates the state file. Uh, when it works great, it gets corrupted. Yeah, and so here, this is a similar role where we are using CloudFormation in a structured way uh, with a wrapping API to help you capture those complexities. Uh, the cluster config here uh, can be extended in a much more ornate manner uh, if you have uh, or desire uh, more intricate network network topologies and security requirements and things like that. You can do things like provide IAM role IDs and network uh, subnet IDs and things like that. Uh, but here you can see that the uh, config is relatively succinct for the 90% use case of I need a cluster, uh, I need it to live in a VPC, and please give me some nodes uh, with IAM permissions that are properly managed. And so here you can see that EKS Cuddle went through and then a templated the CloudFormation stacks and applied those two stacks to create the cluster. It took about 15 minutes. Uh, EKS Cuddle is the official um, CLI that's going to be uh, recommended by Amazon. And it is primarily maintained by Weaveworks with the open source governance model. Cool. So now we got a cluster, but we want to do more than just kubectl against the Kubernetes. And if you actually look at what uh, is inside of the cluster. So say we were to just do all resources, more or less, in all namespaces. Uh, you can see that this cluster is probably about an hour old. And it's pretty boring, you know. It's just got Kube Proxy, Core DNS, and uh, two of the node services uh, for integrating with AWS. But how can we get from an empty cluster created by EKS Cuddle to something that's GitOps ready and providing the actual value services to build my platform and serve traffic to customers. And so here, get rid of the cluster creation command. If you go to this section here, we want to create a Git repo. And we're going to use some EKS Cuddle experimental commands in order to enable Flux inside of the cluster, hook it up to the repo, and then actually um, enable a profile that will be put into that Git repo and then synced to the cluster. So let's go ahead and set up a Git repository. Uh, here I'm at github.com slash new, and I have an excellent repository creation um, suggestion here. 
I love the um, auto-generated names uh, that GitHub suggests. So our repository for our cluster management for our business infrastructure is going to be called probable octo potato. And then we'll just say that it's EKS at map mesh GitOps stuff, right? I'm gonna make this repository public, but you could make it private and then put the proper credentials into Flux. And I don't need a readme or anything like that. Cool, so we got our repo here. I'm just gonna go ahead and clone that down. I like using the hub command line tool uh, because it just allows you to have more succinct commands when you're using GitHub all the time. You should check it out if you don't use hub. I highly recommend it for anybody using GitHub. Let's hop into here, we have an empty repo. So now heading back to the lab, I'm gonna enable experimental commands for EKS Cuddle. We'll just make sure to do that in both here. And then now I wanna set up my GitHub user and repository. So here my GitHub username personally is StealthyBox and then my GitHub repository is called probable octo potato. Just set those variables so it's easy for me to copy and paste these commands. So let's go ahead. And then here you can see that I'm going to do EKS cuddle enable repo for the cluster called app mesh in the region US West 2. Just to make sure as a sanity check, let's go ahead and list the clusters that are currently available inside of my region. So you can see my default region here is US West 2, but I could change that if I wanted. And I do have an app mesh cluster. Uh, get user, you can set this to whatever you want, as well as the email and that kind of thing. And then uh, here you can see that the get URL that's being passed to the enable repo command, which will set up Flux with the proper credentials inside of our EKS cluster, um, is going to operate on a get URL at GitHub for my user and my configured repo. Here we're creating PKI. You'll notice here as well that in addition to installing Flux, we're also getting Helm Operator and Tiller. Uh, this is using Helm V2, uh, but we do have experimental Helm V3 support. So. Some great banter here about nodes and EKS in the chat. And then here we see that we're just waiting on Helm operator to come up. So now it says that Helm operator was started successfully and then we also had Flux start up. And we got a couple uh, success logs for all of the manifests that were applied in order to bootstrap Flux, Memcache, Helm operator, and Tiller, which are the basic components uh, for bootstrapping GitOps in your cluster. Uh, this is all built into EKS Cuddle, so I don't have to do any of this manually against the cluster with my own manifests and that kind of thing. And then here I have this cluster, so or I mean um, this SSH public key, uh, which is the identity of Flux inside of my repo, or inside of my cluster. And so here you can see the log, the last log message is actually asking me to do something. It says, please configure your probable octo potato config repo uh, so that the flux public key has right access. So I'll go ahead and do that here. We'll just open up the settings page for my repository, uh, go into deploy keys, and then we'll add one here. I'll just add my key and say that this is the flux deploy key um, for EKS app mesh. We'll allow write access and add the key. So at this point now, um, Flux will converge and the our GitOps pipeline will be set up. Notice I haven't used kubectl to write to the cluster at all. So there we go. Uh, the next thing is, okay, well now I have an empty Git repo that's telling Flux to do nothing. That's not very useful, right? 
So I've gone in and I've enabled flux inside of my cluster with the EKS cuddle enable repo command. But now, can we get something a little bit more useful? There is an EKS app mesh profile that was put together by my peer Stefan. Uh, and here we can use the enable profile command in the app mesh cluster in order to get to a point where we can have a service mesh set up for us automatically that takes advantages of the IAM roles that we previously configured when we set up our cluster. So here I'm just taking advantage of the same uh, environment variables that I set up previously and I'm doing enable profile app mesh on cluster app mesh uh, with a particular revision for the git repo in the proper region. So what's going to happen here is it's actually checking out a temporary copy of my git repo and then it's taking the repo template that we had, putting that into the repo and then updating for me the contents of that repository. And so if you look now and you actually refresh this, here was our new repo and here we can see that we have a base configuration directory as well as a management for Flux. And so if I were to do a git pull, oh, might have to add app mesh quick start components. Nice, yeah. And then I were to open up that code base here. And where is my code window? Sorry, I'm fighting with my window manager now. And here we are. All right. So we can see here uh, that we have our flux manifests now managed by GitOps. And then we, uh, so you can control like the GitOps pipeline, you know, just by updating your Git repo now. And then you can also see that there is app mesh system and a namespace for that, um, as well as an installation of Flagger, uh, the proper CRDs for the canary analysis, and uh, a little bit of Prometheus and Grafana stuff here. So I would expect now, you said Lee, I mean, this is supposed to be GitOps, right? So if you update the Git repo, then wouldn't the cluster get updated? And I would have that same expectation. And so let's go look around. Okay, namespace. Actually not seeing it pop up here yet. Maybe Flux hasn't synced yet. Let's go ahead and do a Flux sync really quick. There we are. So Flux syncs on a five minute basis by default. Uh, and I'm just gonna go ahead and poke it uh, using my port forward access to the Flux namespace. Uh, this, can be, this can be controlled by RBAC. Uh, it's something that you can give your devs access to. It, you can also set up a Flux webhook here so that it happens immediately when you update your Git repository. Cool. So then here, we just check. And then now we have everything set up. Uh, so we just, flink, we just synced Flux up and our um, app mesh, mesh was set up. So here we can see that 35 seconds old, we have an app mesh. So our GitOps pipeline is working here. Let's go ahead and make a commit. Um, I'm gonna come into the demo folder here. Just make sure that this is visible. And then here in the namespace resource for demo, uh, which holds our application called pod info, uh, we can see that the uh, annotation for flux to ignore this namespace is set to true. This is a quick trick that you can use if you want flux to stop managing something at a namespace level. Uh, which is usually a good divider for your applications uh, to kind of get some some management and uh, security isolation for different constructs inside of Kubernetes. Um, very clever little trick here. Instead of like having to add this annotation to every single thing, um, like updating the deployment, updating the pod auto scaler, updating the canary, you can just go and ignore the namespace altogether. Right. So if I were to come in here and set this to false. 
And then I were, can look at my status. So I'm a dev, you know, I'm changing the config repo. I can look at the diff, right? Now I'm gonna make a commit. Looks good to me. I'm just gonna say enable our demo application. And then we'll deploy all the things. All right, so let's go ahead and do a git push. And since we haven't set up the flux webhook, I'm just gonna also make sure to then do a, what am I doing? Flux CTL sync. So here we can see that our commit SHA is being applied. So that's the 6A166 commit SHA right there. Uh, it's being synced up with Flux right now. So Flux is pulling the Git repo uh, and making sure to apply our config. And um, ultimately, when we enable this namespace, everything inside of it is going to be deployed. And so here we have an app mesh gateway. We've got a canary declaration, very interesting custom resource here that we can talk about, as well as the deployment and pod auto scaler for our pod info application. Um, yep, here we are. Cool. We're synced up. And if we were to say, get the namespaces for our cluster, we can now see that we have this demo namespace in addition to our app mesh system namespace. Uh, everything else here is either uh, default EKS stuff or uh, our flux namespace for actually controlling our GitOps pipeline. And then, so um, if we've deployed our application, then we should be able to calculate the URL in order to access it. And I believe that is in the app bootstrap section. So here's the URL calculation. Let's go ahead and see if we can get that. Here we have an ingress um, and it's currently not reached yet. So we'll just have to check on the um, DNS propagation of this. We found it. Oh, it's not found yet. Maybe I need to take off the HTTP portion of that for the DNS. Well. While we're waiting, we can kind of talk a little bit about what this setup actually looks like. Oh, and then we'll look at all namespaces there. So here in the demo namespace, we have the pod info canary as well as the pod info virtual service. Uh, these are app mesh ideas. Notice though that if you actually go um, to our repository, we don't have really anything about um, virtual services, right? We have this virtual node, uh, which points our virtual services that are expected uh, to the service uh, inside of Kubernetes. And then we have the deployment that exposes the proper ports and the uh, readiness probes uh, for the mesh to endpoint to. Uh, but as far as like how this is then operated, uh, what's fascinating to me is if you look in the pod info application, let's talk a little bit about the Canary resource. So this is a flagger API, Canaries. And here we can see uh, that we are expecting the service mesh to be provided by the app mesh provider. Uh, flagger is interoperable with Istio, Glue, and app mesh, and various other um, service mesh providers such as Linkerd2. Uh, and so you can expect to be able to use a canary resource uh, with diverse number of network topologies and platform topologies if you're trying to provide a smart service mesh capability to your developers and uh, operations teams. And so here you can see I have two target refs. One is for the deployment and the other is for the accompanying horizontal pod autoscaler. Um, Flagger uses native Kubernetes objects and does not reinvent the ideas of deployments and auto scaling 
Uh, and it does so in some pretty smart ways. If you're interested in the mechanisms, you can read about it in our docs. Uh, and then we also need to point it to the service that we want to be able to replicate for a canary. So what Flagger will do after you give it these three references, it'll actually make copies of those things inside of your cluster and start mutating them according to the, the way that you've described your behavior um, inside of the canary object. And so if you tell Flagger, hey, like when I make a new release, if you could actually turn that new release into a canary and then start iterating over it in time periods that are you know, controlled by a highly available Kubernetes operator. Uh, and then you could like maybe just not give it all the traffic at once, but maybe start with 5% until you get to half of the traffic being diverted to the canary, you know, before deciding whether or not to promote it. And hey, while you're at it, could you maybe check, you know, that while you're deploying a new version of my application, like you could make sure these Prometheus metrics that are provided by our service mesh, you know, stay within some reasonable thresholds such as uh, above a 99% availability, you know, um, for the success rate, as well as to make sure that our P99 latency doesn't get way out of whack. You know, so here we have a, a 30 seconds um, threshold of 500 milliseconds. And then also, you know, could you do a load test? Like these are fantastic declarations that you can do in from a GitOps uh, perspective, you know, through a declarative API. And um, Let's just go ahead and check to see. So our app's deployed here. The DNS propagated, it just took a moment. And this is routing through our uh, ingress gateway. And so here you can see that we have the pod info app deployed, right? And then we also have this awesome um, mascot here. Tamo actually was the person who designed this. So it's pretty sweet. And, um, so you can see here that uh, the pod info application is sending requests over and over again. And if we change anything about the deployment, we'll start to see things here. Um, and so traditionally, if you were to do a rolling update inside of Kubernetes, you might get a little bit of shifting of traffic uh, as numbers of pods go up and you get load balance between them, but you don't have a lot of granular control over the way that that traffic is shaped. So let's go ahead and do a deployment. Uh, I'm gonna just go into my Git repo here and I'll go ahead and go to the pod info deployment. And if you actually go to the lab, uh, we teach you how to do this with customize as well. If you want to factor things a little bit differently. I saw um, that somebody did have a question uh, earlier about what are some good ways to factorize manifests. Customize is one way. Uh, using Helm with args and in your values is another way. Uh, and then here at Weaveworks, we recommend something called JK config. Uh, which if you go to the website, you can learn all about using JavaScript to actually factor uh, your Kubernetes manifests, uh, which some people might, you know, have bad taste for, but JavaScript's got great editor support and you can do loops and maps and filters. And it's one of the most popular programming languages out there. So, yeah. Uh, also things like uh, JSONet are quite popular. Uh, so here we have a logo, we have colors, um, just some of the parameters for pod info. I'll just uh, update this to a new version of the application and then Let's change our image as well. And if I just update the deployment spec, let's see, uh, deploy a cooler version of the app. And let me stage my git push here. Let's also get some flagger logs going. Let's see, do I have, so here you can see um, how Flagger initially bootstrapped our Canary deployment, uh, but we've only deployed one version of our app so far, so it doesn't mean much yet. Um, but if you want to know what Flagger is doing, you can read the logs. Uh, you can also look at the Canary resource. So here you can say you can see that in our demo namespace we have the pod info canary and it's just initialized. Right. But if we were to do a git push, and then again since we don't have the webhook, we'll just do a flux sync. Then uh, what we should see is that in our flagger logs, 
the new canary will be picked up. And then it'll start actually mutating the deployments that are inside of the cluster. Say, boo, what does that mean? Let's look at the deploys in the demo namespace. Here we have the pod info application, and then we have primary. Primary is actually the copy that's managed by Flagger for you. And so I don't have this primary deployment inside of my GitOps repo because it's a consequence of the Flagger controller obeying my description of the Canary uh, resource, right? And so I've described to Flagger, hey, could you turn this pod info app into a Canary? Then when I change the version inside of my Git repo, Flagger will notice, right? And so you can see here, it says, hey, I got a new revision. Right. I'm going to scale up the pod info demo canary um, instance of your deployment. Right. And then now it's going through iterations. And if we look at our pod info application, assuming I didn't make a misconfiguration inside of my Git repo, then every now and then the traffic uh, should be starting to alternate between our new image and our cooler version of the application. You can see here we had a request for pod info 3.11. Right? And the way that this is described is using weights. And so progressively, as the canary is rolling out, regardless of the number of replicas that are staged inside of my Kubernetes cluster, traffic is being distributed according not to the representation of the infrastructure inside of Kubernetes, but to how I've declared that I want my service mesh to be configured from a general aspect inside of my canary resource. Now, Flagger is way cooler than this. This is traffic weights, which is really useful for services where you provide one-time requests, or if you want to check that your update to business logic, um, if, if you want to separate the metrics out and make sure that things like latency, you know, and the, you know, proper uh, metrics of success that you'd be expecting, such as like purchase or, um, you know, whatever you are making a change about um, are rolling out properly. And it seems here is uh, that we have quite a bit of canary uh, progress. And then if we were actually to look at the canary object again, uh, we are in the promoting stage as far as the canary state machine goes. But um, soon enough, if this traffic is successful for a significant period of time, then we will meet the rollout threshold that is described in our canary object and the canary will be promoted to the production version of the app receiving all of the traffic. Right. And then uh, Prakash asks, could we do progressive delivery on a different cluster? Uh, that is an excellent question. And one of the coolest things about Flux is it's not super opinionated about how you are pointed to different Git repos. Uh, since the way that we recommend GitOps is done in a pull based workflow, where the cluster is, resp is responsible for looking at its config and then making those things happen, you could actually have multiple clusters pointed at the same configuration repo and either in different branches or folders or just looking at the same folder. And so say I were to point three clusters at this same exact repository, um, if that was the behavior that you wanted when I changed this deployment manifest, it will roll out to, to all of the flux DDs inside of all of my different clusters. Similarly, if you wanted to do something with more synchronization, uh, you could, you know, with your deployment team, um, make variants of that Git repository and then roll them out to different um, clusters by controlling the branch or the folder that they look at uh, and then choosing what those canary descriptions would be like. Really great question about multi-cluster canaries. Um, since it's a very common use case for um, somebody who's, you know, shipping traffic at scale. So, but yeah, I would imagine now uh, that our canary is finished here. So you can see that it's been succeeded here uh, because nothing went wrong uh, in our deployment. And this is probably my favorite uh, GIF that we have here. So props to Tano uh, for creating such a cute mascot. And uh, he's got his little bunny, so he gets to be a, a what cuttlefish were meant to do, right? So, yeah. Raphael mentions that uh, we just use two flux instances per cluster, uh, one for core work and then 
another for the apps that we actually deploy there. Really common topology of when you start to talk about tenancy. Um, even if you're not in a multi-tenant environment serving clients, uh, you could call, you know, um, like some requirements from your security team for, you know, deployment team A to not have access to dev team B's resources. And so, yeah, you could use separate fluxes per namespace in order to do that kind of thing. Yeah. And, um, yeah. I, I, I see you calling out the cuttlefish there, Christian. See you at KubeCon. We'll get you that t-shirt. Yes. Um, <laughs> Thanks for that. Is it a good time? I we I don't think we're going to get through all these questions. I mean, it's just really been uh, exciting, and I think people have been helping each other. Um, so I'll try to. If you're really burning, you can. Uh, it's not drowning the rabbit. It's cuddling the rabbit. <laughs> um, <laughs> Spinnaker has come up, right? Uh, maybe that we'll start with that question. Yeah. The last, like you know, can they work together? Can they? Uh, uh, how do they compare? What's some things that we can share? Yeah, for one, my experience with Spinnaker um, has been biased to not be positive. And that's um, from, you know, experience in several environments from even before I worked in this job. Um, one of the things that uh, I do not like about Spinnaker is that the configuration is basically stored in, in the UI um, through its database. Uh, and so it's not a real GitOpsy tool, you know, um, and an improperly set up Jenkins cluster has the same issue for me. Uh, and so moving these tools uh, to a model where I can actually check out the configuration and write, you know, scripts and lints and automations, you know, as a DevOps kind of person uh, inside of a Git repo and make commits against them and, you know, add policy around like who should be changing things. Uh, as opposed to learning another UI and teaching that tool to my team um, is a big difference, I think, uh, from the approach that a controller driven by custom resources like Flagger uh, takes to doing progressive delivery. Now, I, I think you should do whatever you know you can to make your tools work for you. And so I do know folks who've had a lot of the, uh, success with Spinnaker the other uh, thing that's a little bit dissonant to me is the verbiage collides with a lot of the um, like vocab inside of a Kubernetes API. So things like services and deployments like mean different things in Spinnaker. Uh, it was really built for an EC2 environment in my personal opinion. Um, one thing that Spinnaker does excel at is uh, since it causes you to recreate a lot of those ideas, um, then it provides a very clear path for somebody who's trying to create a, a multi-cluster, multi-region topology for progressive deployment. So it's really, really interesting tool. Uh, um, another uh, topic that came up that maybe was answered within the thread, but maybe, you know, questions come up like EKS Cuddle versus Terraform. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, obviously we created, someone on our team created EKS Cuddle, but you know, we're not here to like debate one or the other, but what are some kind of common pros and cons if you're trying to do GitOps specifically? Uh, one thing is uh, you're basically looking at, you know, uh, some, somebody who's using Terraform uh, with their teams in production, you know, uh, hopefully they've reached a level of maturity, you know, where you can use uh, outside of the infrastructure kind of operator. Uh, if you haven't seen uh, Atlantis before. Um, this is something to look into. So if you're if you're an avid Terraform user, then Atlantis will do things like run a Terraform plan for every pull request that you make, you know, in order to check like what whatever your merge workflow is. And then to also have something uh, that's applying the master branch uh, of your Terraform stuff continuously. It's not that you can't do GitOps with Terraform, uh, but it's it's not built like that out of the box unless you're using something like Terraform Enterprise. Um, but you can structure some very mature workflows. Um, you know, if you're a, a platform team that owns infrastructure, I think Terraform is great. Uh, Terraform is also very agnostic and there's a bunch of providers out there that allow you to, to create some really cool modules around your infrastructure. Things like managing GitLab and firewalls and DNS and things like that. Um, you gotta do what works for you. Um, comparing Terraform to something like EKS Cuddle. EKS Cuddle is purpose-built. 
it provides a Kubernetes style API. Um, so if you look at the config uh, that I deployed, just call it cluster config, right? So this has a lot of similarities to the kinds of things that you would be checking into your repository if you were using Kubernetes. Uh, and this API is a succinct way uh, for you to have a lot of control over the way that you deploy your EKS clusters. Uh, both the EKS module for Terraform as well as EKS Cuddle are maintained in partnership with teams at EKS. Um, we can, you know, as we work, speak authoritatively, authoritatively about EKS Cuddle, but do work with folks who use the Terraform stuff. Uh, do what works for you. Um, I think that EKS Cuddle provides a lot of UX um, to streamline, like, it, if you, if you need a tool that gets you clusters and hooks them up to your Git repos and provides you usage of things like profiles and you haven't started using EKS on Terraform already, I would take a look at EKS Cuddle because I think it's going to accelerate your platform team's ability to deliver clusters and compute and the Git repos that are necessary to do that in a secure and auditable way uh, to your dev teams. So. Uh, and uh, Eric was asking a question about uh, GitOps versus DevSecOps in terms of core principles. Uh, Eric, maybe mm -hmm. if you have more details there, please share, but what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, assuming no further details, uh, I really like the premise of that question because DevSecOps is about um, really m crossing the lines and improving communication between multiple disciplines that are very important uh, to the, the software business assets side of your um, company. It's, it's not just software, it's infrastructure. And then both of those things from the lens of security uh, in order to basically serve your business from a, from a continuity standpoint. Right. And so like making sure that people don't touch, you know, things that they really shouldn't have access to uh, and always having an audit log of what has been changed are things where GitOps serves particularly the security portion of DevSecOps very well while still providing a high velocity interface that's familiar for ops and devs teams to create change. And so oftentimes the, the friction that you see inside of an enterprise from a security team operating with the technical teams from either an operational or development uh, perspective is that like security feels like it's getting in my way. But what they really just want to know is like, can you keep us in the loop and provide you know, the necessary amount of process for us to review change so that we are meeting our policies? With something like GitOps, as well as if you're integrating things like Gatekeeper, these other tools that allow you to validate um, your files, and then also with things like pod security policies and network policy, you can check all of that stuff into Git. You can make sure that security has the proper access controls to change those things. Uh, you can ensure that the people have the proper reviewership rights and that things don't get merged without review. And you always have that Git log, even if your cluster goes away. So. If you want to know how your business looked like from an infrastructure perspective two years ago or five years ago or seven years ago, since you're going to be using GitOps successfully for the next decade, um, then I would say that those things mesh together very well. It's a great question. Great. Uh, Christian asked, are, are there webhooks available to alert when a cluster is out of sync? Out of sync. Um, there is a Prometheus metrics from FluxD that is exposed that you should alert on uh, to determine the overall sync latency of your FluxDs. Um, that's probably the simplest answer to that. Uh, there's also things like kubediff um, that a lot of people enjoy for getting like Slack notifications and things like that. Um, as far as like the number of things that are you're syncing in your cluster, I would caution you against like alerting against everything. Um, but yeah, you, you need to be able to, to monitor the stuff that matters. Yeah. And then AJ asks, are there examples around multi-cluster deployment, dev stage and production? Uh, I believe Stefan has a repo for this, but I'd have to um, go pull it up. Yeah, I agree. Uh, really, once you understand how to create more interesting Git repo topologies with multiple flux Ds inside of either at a namespace or multi namespace or global cluster level. Um, like for instance, somebody asked a question, uh, I can't remember in what context, but 
uh, they wanted to know like where's the balance you know between having the global flux for managing cluster infrastructure as well as per namespace fluxes and then what about apps that need multiple namespaces like can I manage that from a single repo uh, and that third case is interesting and kind of teaches you about the first two cases which is that you can either have multiple flux D's with per namespace rights pointing to the same git repo you could have multiple repos for that app and then one flux D you know um, it's it's all all kind of relative to the way that you see that you should separate and partition things yeah. and then that expands out to multi-cluster very well as you start to split up the cluster variants inside of your control repo or repos so um, so another question is, what's your favorite way of customizing resources for different environments? Uh, one, quick, one case is uh, around image promotion, the other uh, slightly different, sorry, here's a question, uh, slightly different configuration between environments. Um, for environmental differences, um, it depends on how complicated your manifests are getting. Uh, in my experience, Customize is a general enough tool uh, for you to get most of the way, uh, but it can become very verbose if you can't make the way it wants you to use it fit your use cases, uh, particularly if you're using like config files that aren't YAML and that kind of thing. It's, it can be quite frustrating to use Customize. Um, I've found Helm to be a very powerful and general tool, um, especially with Helm v3 removing the network accessible like in cluster privileged daemon uh, that like gets rid of a bunch of the benefits of RBAC. Um, we have Helm operators supporting Helm v3 and I like the way that a well written Helm chart um, exposes factoring options in an abstract way. Um, JK CFG does this even better as long as you're good with JavaScript and have people who understand that. Um, Jasonet, it, it's it's hard for people. Um, very powerful. So, however you want to factor your manifests, um, I mean, I would say my favorite, you know, has been Helm, uh, but with a lot of caveats. Um, it's it's just the fact that it's string templating can be pretty frustrating. Um, I'd I'd say that. Uh, a mature team with people who are able to learn, document, and contribute back to these newer tools, um, such as JK and JSONnet, um, in the context of Kubernetes config files. Uh, also, Q is up and coming and has more examples being built up. That's um, Q uh, from the Go team at Google. Go check it out. It's becoming quite popular with the people that I know. And uh, I've never used it though. Excellent. Um, well, thanks everybody. Uh, we're well, completely at the end of the hour. Uh, let me just share. I'm going to uh, do this ending. So we will try to address um, your questions. Can you see my slide? Hopefully. Um, so we will address your remaining questions. Uh, it uh, either uh, you'll all get emails from me, and you can just come back with me in case you said, "Oh, hey, there's something else that came up." Uh, or here's our calendar um, of upcoming events for the single source of truth. Here's our uh, meetup page, uh, which is the best way to know what's coming up in the calendar. And we have the Slack channel as well. So if there are areas where you want to chat with Lee uh, or our team, uh, there's a flagger channel, uh, in fact, uh, or as well as um, I don't know if we have one. Well, we have one for this GitOps hands-on. Yeah, so those are the various areas. If you get stuck or if you have further questions, definitely come out to this. And uh, it sounds like this was a very popular topic, so maybe we might do it again, even though it'll be recorded and we'll have it on our YouTube channel um, if people want to sort of have this as a place to talk more about these GitOps-related questions. Um, thanks so much for your active participation, and we will follow up to answer your remaining questions. So thanks to Lee and thanks for Stacy to organize and thanks all of you for coming. We will see you next time. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.